Okay, we'll kick off now. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining in on Wildlife Queensland's Greater Glider webinar. We're really pleased to have you along. My name is Matt Cecil. I'm the Wildlife Queensland's Project Manager and I get to look after the Queensland Glider Network and work um, in, a, in the space of caring for gliders and conserving our glider species. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, Wildlife Queensland acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. For those of you who couldn't join into this webinar live, hopefully you're enjoying the replay. Um, and for all of you who are joining in live, if you have to duck off at some point, never fear, you will be able to view a replay uh, at some point in the future. That replay will be available to watch via the Wildlife Queensland webpage. Uh, and on that page, there's an events page, and this is all hidden under the um, Talking Wildlife webinar series. So if you would like to watch it again, please jump onto the website and have a look at that. Um, during this presentation, if you do have any questions, and fingers crossed you will have plenty of questions, uh, towards the end of the, of the webinar, we'll do a question and answer session. So for you, type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom, and we'll fingers crossed get to your question and ask it uh, of our presenters. Um, never fear though, if we don't quite get to your question, we'll do our best to answer those and make them available uh, via the website um, and that replay. Um, this morning, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Theresa Eyre from the Queensland Herbarium uh, and a team, Josh and Sam from the Yellow Belly Glider Network uh, joining us. Both of these presenters and presentations come from differing, differing angles. Um, Teresa comes from you know, almost 25 years plus of, of hard, hard earned, hard work and hard fought science. And Josh and Sam come from this from almost a, a, a casual hobby bordering now into an obsession on our nocturnal and native wildlife. So it's two, um, I guess, polar directions, but uh, they all arrive at the same conclusion. And that's that um, greater gliders as a species need considerable help and they need your um, conservation effort. This webinar itself has been brought to you on behalf of the Logan City Council as part of a much wider project on greater gliders in the Logan local government area. Wildlife Queensland have been lucky to jump on board and help Logan to do a range of greater glider population surveys, some nest box installation and monitoring for greater gliders, uh, some community workshops, this particular webinar, um, and some community spotlight events, um, all in the, in the with the overall aim of learning more about greater gliders in Logan and also engaging and educating the community about this particular species, their conservation needs and what you can do to help them in your backyard. The greater glider is listed vulnerable under environmental protection and biodiversity and conservation law and under the federal legislation and Queensland legislation as well. So they are deemed to be at risk of extinction if we don't do something to help them. Um, they're not really well known to tolerate habitat alteration and fragmentation. Um, and they're quite reliant on mature eucalypt forest and their associated tree hollows as a hollow dependent species. So they're really um, at, at a loss when it comes to habitat loss, fragmentation and alteration. And you'll learn more about that during today's presentation. I'm really pleased to be a part of this webinar and share some of this conservation information with you all. And I think you'll have a really great time listening to what our presenters have to say. So I'll welcome, welcome today's first guest presenter, Dr. Teresa Eyre. Teresa is an applied ecologist with a highly skilled team of zoologists, botanists and ecologists within the Queensland Herbarium. Teresa loves greater gliders and yellow belly gliders and has kept up with the science of these species since completion of her PhD on them in the early 2000s. Teresa is always willing and open to help Wildlife Queensland out with advice and, and project design uh, and we're really pleased to have her with us today. Um, Teresa will be presenting about the bio biology and life history of greater gliders, as well as the main threats to glider species and conservation requirements. So over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Matt. Um, I shall share my screen. Right. Can, can you see that? Yep. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Matt, for the introduction and to Wildlife Queensland for the invitation to talk to you today about one of the best things in the world being greater gliders. Another best thing in the world is yellow belly gliders, but we won't talk about them so much today. Um, we are certainly lucky to have greater gliders in Queensland. In fact, we, um, and I'll get onto this in a minute, we 
in Queensland, we um, are responsible for quite a chunk of their distribution. So for today's out um, talk, I'm just going to briefly go through the bio biology and ecology of the greater glider, their threats, um, conservation needs, and what we can do and what we are doing to um, help them uh, get through this uh, tricky conservation period for them. But to start off with, why, why do we care about um, greater gliders? Well, obviously they're absolutely gorgeous and they're enigmatic and they're beautiful, but they're nocturnal and we don't uh, get to see them very much, unlike koalas, which are often um, in the media, limelight. Many, many years ago, there was a paper written about uh, greater gliders and calling them the, a barometer of change. And this is because um, we felt back then, which this was over 30 years ago, that they are so in tune with their habitat, they, they are quite sensitive to change and they do reflect habitat requirements that a number of other species are reliant on that um, we felt that if if there was a decline or a blip in, in their population numbers, then that perhaps there is something going wrong in our ecosystems. And we are seeing that now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. As Matt um, introduced, he, uh, the conservation status of the greater glider is vulnerable uh, throughout its range. However, um, with the recent wildfires and the fact that there has been dramatic declines in the last 30 years, and that's within my career range, so that's been quite a scary thing to watch. Um, the, the, there is uh, moves afoot to uplist them um, throughout most of their range uh, to the endangered status. So first of all, what is their distribution? We get them all throughout Eastern um, Australia from uh, central Victoria all the way up to the Windsor Tablelands um, up here in North Queensland. Um, and as you can see, we have a pretty decent chunk of their um, distribution within Queensland. But within that very broad distribution, um, their area of occupancy is, is quite limited because they are um, very reliant on tall eucalypt woodlands and forests and very, very reliant on particular habitat features such as habitat um, hollow bearing trees, um, particular food species, and these aren't found everywhere. Um, and they happen to share a similar distribution to the yellow belly glider, but we're not talking about them today. Um, we're talking about the greater glider. So <clears throat> you may be aware that there was a recent paper that just came out last year, which unraveled some of the taxonomy of the greater glider. So we've got, um, as you can see, as you saw that there's a massive distribution across Eastern Australia. Um, and this paper sort of identified something that has been speculated and talked about for, for many years about different species or subspecies within that distribution range of Petroides volans, which is the um, complex group. Um, and the paper uh, identified that uh, the northern glider is, a, is its own species, Petroides minor. There's a central glider species, um, which they named Amelatus, and there's a southern glider, um, which is the Petroides volans, which is what the, the main uh, species has been known as last however many years. However, there's, it's been pretty hard, it's pretty hard for us as field ecologists and um, to, to really tell the difference between these two guys, <laughs> the central and the southern. Um, and also there is some sort of conjecture about where the di those distributions begin and end. So in the meantime, the species technical committees at the state and federal levels have, have agreed uh, until we get more information about unravelling the distributions of these, uh, the central and southern, that we'll um, call them Petroides volans, but um, acknowledge that there is a central and southern um, species types. Their biology is um, basically they're quite small gliders, even though they're at the largest gliders um, of all our Australian gliders. Um, I put this photo in of Matt Hemmings. Um, this is from Carly Starr. They've, uh, she, 
they've done some work capturing uh, greater gliders up north and this is from Bluff State Forest which is one of the northern extents of the of the range of the, um, the greater glider so that's a Petteroides minor and as you can see in Matt's hands it's tiny it's it's quite a tiny little thing um, but the northern, sub, the northern species is about a kilo lighter than our southern species um, at around 1.1 kilos and our southern species get up to about 1.8 to, to 2 kilos. The cute thing about greater gliders is that when they glide, um, their patagium or their, their membrane extends from their ankles to their elbows, which is unlike our other glider species. Um, such as the squirrel gliders, yellow bellies, and um, mahoganies and sugar gliders, which extends from their wrists to their ankles. And so when the um, uh, greater glider glides, and you don't get to see that very often because they're quite sedentary animals, but when you do, it's awesome to see because they tuck their little paws under their chin and, and take off. So they're in a sort of an odd shape as compared to um, when we see our other gliders um, take off. They are, as I said, nocturnal, they're leaf eating, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. And they are, um, uh, have a very small home range compared to our other gliders as well. Pro mostly that reflects their, um, their diet, where they have to spend a lot of energy um, uh, digesting eucalypt leaves, basically. They're beautiful and within a population you can get white ones and black ones and motley colored ones there's all these different color morphs from um, the, the white through through to these um, almost pure black so feeding um, they are leaf eating animals just like koalas um, they have particular species uh, they they um, have particular species that they rely on more than others and these tree species that is and these are species that tend to have um, higher dry matter nitrogen levels in the leaves because that um, allows digestion and breaking down of toxicity of a lot of phenols that are, are in eucalypt leaves um, so and we'll, we'll have a look at what some of their favorite species in Queensland in a minute um, Within their favorite species, um, we just missed the little glider chewing that young leaf, but they will preferentially select young leaves because these are easier to, to digest. Oh, there he goes again. Um, okay, so some favorite foodie species in North Queensland with uh, Carimbia intermedia, which is the red bloodwood. Spotted gums, which is the Carimbia citriodora, Eucalyptus teredicornis. I'm sure you're all familiar with that one. Um, it's very broad range across Queensland. That's the forest red gum, beautiful. It's also a favorite of koalas. Big, um, beautiful gum tree. Uh, Eucalyptus portuensis, which is stringy bark, and gum top box, which is Eucalyptus molecana. And very similar to for our central and southern uh, glider species, uh, species as well. They preferentially like those species. Um, and this is because um, for some of those species, we do know that they do have that higher nitrogen um, content <clears throat> in their leaves. Those species I've highlighted there are also happen to be particular favorites of the yellow belly glider, um, but we're talking about the greater glider. So uh, here's a, um, some habitat, which greater gliders love, and so do yellow belly gliders. Um, and this is Eucalyptus latsiensis, which is a, a stringy bark with lots of um, red bloodwood in it as well. Um, another favorite of greater gliders, not so much for yellow belly gliders. This one they both think is delicious, Eucalyptus molecana, the um, gum top box, and spotted gum and uh, stringy bark forest and iron bark, yum. The other important thing for greater gliders, really, really, really important, is uh, den trees, habitat trees. And they, look at that photo, isn't it beautiful? That's one of Josh's. Um, the, sorry, now I've lost my train of thought. Um, yes, so, and they are so reliant on 
habitat trees, um, hollow bearing trees, and they require for a, a greater, one greater glider with a home range of say three hectares, they need at least three hollow bearing trees per hectare. But it's not just favourite um, species that uh, greater gliders will select on, it's also the size of those trees. So it's very important structurally. Um, for feed trees, and this is some work from my colleagues um, at the herbarium, Jeff Smith and um, friends, and they found after tracking greater gliders that they do preferentially pref um, look for particular size trees to feed in, anything bigger than 30 centimetres diameter. So 30 centimetres diameter is about hug huggable size. Um, and then trees um, are much bigger, greater than 50 centimetres, which is more than huggable size. Um, and that, of course, reflects that older trees develop um, hollows uh, later in their um, lifespan. So let's move on to the depressing things, threats. Obviously, number one is habitat clearing. And here's a, a model that Melinda Laidlaw from the herbarium helped us put together. It's a Maxent model. Um, this is reflecting the habitat of greater gliders. The red is top-notch habitat, um, pre-clearing. Um, and this is what we've got left. So particularly in the southern and central parts of the distribution of the greater glider, we've lost um, not quite 50%, but pushing it. It's been a bit better, um, less clearing up north. If we look at that um, using regional ecosystems, which are mapped ecosystem types that we have for Queensland, um, we've gone through and identified the top uh, or the important habitats that are, or regional ecosystems that greater gliders um, need and to survive. Um, and if you look at the light green, that's what is uh, left today, and the dark green is what we have lost. So, um, particularly in southeast Queensland um, and the, um, the New England tablelands, quite substantial, and we need to keep that in mind. Of course, broad scale clearing has largely um, ceased now under the Vegetation Management Act, um, but of course, there still are exceptions for development, you know, we're a society and some things need to happen, I guess, sometimes. CSG or um, coal seam gas is, is a big one. Um, it might not look like a big swathe that's cleared, but um, when you look at it at the landscape scale, it's significant. Um, road widening um, and housing, of course, as well. So greater gliders do decline with loss of large and hollow bearing trees. And I just wanted to point out that even within habitat that is um, intact and not fragmented or not about to be cleared, you do get this variation in habitat quality for, for greater gliders. And this, um, these are the, exactly the same regional ecosystem type. It's just that the one on the left is regrowth. Um, and the one on the right is um, a bit more mature and has that different structure. And I hope, I hope that sort of reflects um, that the one on the left, you're not gonna get greater gliders in. Um, and the one on the right, you're more likely to. So how's our hollow bearing tree resource going in greater glider habitat in Queensland? Um, and we've been collecting this information for many years, the, the team and I, and um, if we look at this um, on the left hand side, that's the average number of hollow bearing trees per hectare. And the prescriptions for number of hollow bearing trees to maintain all hollow obligate species is limited at six hollow bearing trees per hectare. So if we look at that line that reflects six hollow bearing trees per hectare, it looks like for most of our, diff, um, our broad vegetation groups across Queensland, we're going okay. Certainly not for 10B, which is that um, spotted gum forest, which is um, quite heavily logged. Um, but this is including both dead trees and live hollow bearing trees. And now if we take out our dead hollow bearing trees, and we run that again, we can see that we're, we're, we're pushing 
the availability of um, hollow bearing tree resource in greater glider habitat for most of our broad habitats across Queensland. And if we put the little greater glider three habitat, if, if, if we were just looking after greater gliders alone, even then for some of these habitats, um, we are in a, a pretty dire space. We are losing hollow bearing trees. So how are we losing them and how have we lost them? Um, this, sorry, this very grainy photo, it's from Jacobs, um, Maxwell Jacobs seminal book from 1955, which was all about um, forestry and, and maintaining good trees. And he's got a classic line in there, which is useless veterans must be eliminated, eliminated as soon as possible. And that's what forestry did for many, many years because it was, it was about get, get coming up with a good crop of, um, of merchantable timber trees. Um, they don't do that anymore. It's okay. Um, however, the legacy of, of that is that we have lost a lot of those trees were actively taken out as demonstrated by my friend and colleague here, Michael, back when we were doing um, my PhD work. 30 years ago, or whatever. Um, and when I first started, that's uh, what uh, the logging rules were, was to take out those um, useless veterans. Drought is another issue um, where big trees are more uh, likely to suffer hydraulic failure um, and windthrow is another one and prescribed burns as shown in, by this, in this photo by Luke, that um, they're actually like a chimney and this is just, a, you can't even see the little um, prescribed burn that's going through, but it's gone up inside the, the tree um, and it will slowly but surely burn that tree out. So just in the last 20 years, we've seen a decline of 25% um, of large um, hollow bearing trees in my old study site in St. Mary State Forest in Southeast Queensland. Similarly, for dead hollow trees, um, even a bigger decline uh, because they are even more susceptible to burning um, and, um, and declining with um, just very minor prescribed burns. So in St. Mary's again, and a big decline of about 46% in 20 years. So we are losing our trees. The other thing is climate change. And this is the insidious thing that um, we're only just really getting our heads around now, which how it's impacting upon greater gliders. Because of uh, greater gliders unique physiology in, in their capacity to be able to break down toxic eucalypt leaves, um, they can become, that does mean that they can become hypothermic at um, temperatures greater than 20 degrees Celsius, which is not that warm. Um, and at that point, they need to use energy and water to keep cool. And so, as we all know, there's increasing aridity and warmer temperatures um, throughout Queensland and throughout the whole eastern range of the Greater Glider. And this is, has been shown to be playing havoc on their um, physiology. So basically, they stop eating. They stop wanting to come out of the coolness of their um, uh, dentary to, to, to feed. If hot nights, um, if, the, if there's too many hot nights, then they, they effectively stop, stop feeding. And this has been shown in Victoria, and this is the East, East Gippsland area. Um, and there's a student down there, Ben Wagner, has been doing some fantastic work that actually has shown the area of occupancy for greater gliders has declined, um, well, 85% in the 80s, 9% um, now. Um, and they've been able to show that with um, actual distributions of greater gliders. Indirect um, threats include, of course, wildfire um, that's caused by climate change. And we had those unprecedented mega fires, as they were called, throughout southeast Queensland and central Queensland, and of course, all throughout New South Wales and Victoria. Um, this is central Queensland up here, and we had heaps going on. Um, all within greater glider habitat, actually, mostly. Um, and this is not something we should all be shocked about because the, in 2008, the um, Garno report did state that by 2020, we would be seeing some pretty scary fires, um, and we definitely did. So of course, the direct impact of that is loss of 
habitat, <laughs> lots of food and shelter, um, but there's also loss of connectivity between, between habitats that may not have been burnt. The big thing for me that I worry about is after these big mega burns is, is loss of the big hollow bearing trees. And this fantastic photo is from um, Yapoon from the 2018 fires. Um, and I'm gonna show you some distressing photos. I'm sorry, but um, what that means is loss of habitat trees means it's their home, homeless gliders. And these are actually photos that were sent to me from um, colleagues down south. Um, where they firefighters that went in, you know, cleaning up and just found uh, greater gliders lost. Um, another issue is greater gliders once, particularly when the smoke goes up their, into their habitat, into their den tree, they, they panic, of course, um, glide out and get caught up in barbed wire, which is another, another thing we should be trying to move away from. Um, happy story, all those gliders are fine. They all got rescued and re rehabilitated. So what can we do and to, to help greater gliders? Well, knowing the problem is the first step. And I think we, I think we are getting there. I think we do know what the problem is. Um, and, and I think we do know what to do, which is the second step. So the, it's the action uh, step now that we're on to. We need to find future refugia for them. We need to restore habitat where it's lost. We need to protect habitat where it exists. Um, we need to keep watching them, monitoring, and um, overall, we've got to stay positive, collaborate, and engage in projects such as uh, what Josh and Sam are going to talk about next. So there's been quite a few analyses looking at uh, refugia for biodiversity in general, not just greater gliders. Um, so that's a good first step for us to look at. And this is, um, it's very, you probably won't be able to see it, but the green areas indicate uh, reserves, which are also good climate refugia. Um, and this is Ratton State Forest, tiny little block, which is a, an important um, greater glider habitat in Southeast Queensland. We can restore habitat, of course, by increasing the extent and connectivity um, through plantings or managed regrowth. And we're lucky in Queensland that we do, that regrowth is quite easy to manifest and get moving along. Um, it's not so easy down south, they have to do a lot of planting. Uh, but we can also restore habitat by improving condition over time, looking after our, the hot, large old, tr old trees, putting up nest boxes. Um, there's some really fantastic programs underway at the moment, carbon farming schemes such as the Queensland Les Land Restoration Fund and the, and the National Biodiversity Stewardship Program. And these are actively working towards restoring habitat for to, to provide a um, income for people on the land um, through carbon, but only if there's going to be co-benefits for say water um, and biodiversity. Um, and I do know that some of these uh, properties have greater gliders on them and I'm very keen to get up and, and see how that's um, going. Here's some photos that Matt sent me, um, nest boxes, and I think we really need to start having embracing the nest box. I know it can be controversial sometimes. And um, in, in fact, until Matt showed me the, that greater gliders were using nest boxes, it was pretty well under, well, it was thought throughout the scientific community that they wouldn't use them. Um, but we know otherwise now. And um, I know that uh, Wildlife Queensland are looking into when they do use these nest boxes, what time of year, why, why the height of the tree that they use them. So lots of really useful um, information and um, nest boxes might be the go to help us through some of that interim period where uh, we just don't have habitat trees available. In habitat that does exist, um, what do we do? Well, we can stop clearing it for one thing. Um, we can also protect it from uh, prescribed burns. And, and this photo, I don't know if you can tell, but this is um, Brisbane City Council. Actually, before they do a prescribed burn, they rake away all the litter from habitat trees to minimise the impact of, of a prescribed burn getting up into that tree, um, which is fantastic. It's a lot of work, but it, it, it works. 
Um, in logging prescriptions, habitat trees are left. Um, and this is actually yellow billy, billy glider feed tree, Sam and Josh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's also, it's dual purpose. It's um, got uh, habitat, it's got hollows, um, and isn't it yellow billy glider feed tree as well, like win-win. Um, and these are mat marked with a big H and they're left and protected in the forest, as well as recruit habitat trees. Um, we also need to really move to wildlife friendly fencing. We need to keep up monitoring and, you know, in government, it's, it's expensive and takes a lot of work. And that's why um, community groups like Wildlife Queensland and the Yellow Belly Glider Project are just, and land care groups are just so important um, and why are, we like to keep connection with those groups in government because we can't, we can't keep up with it all. Um, and there's such important work going on out there. Um, and spotlighting, go, go and join the Yellow Belly Glider Project. It's so much fun and um, it's quite easy to do. There's lots of citizen science projects um, that are on offer in the Atlas of Living Australia. And of course, yeah, join the Queensland Glider Network. So by looking after our greater gliders, um, we're not just looking after them, we're looking after a, a huge range of other species. You know, 13% of all of Australia's frogs, reptiles, mammals and birds are dependent on hollow bearing trees. If we look after hollow bearing trees for greater gliders, we're, it's not just for greater gliders. Um, and I can't fit on all the and numerous amount of species that will benefit if we look after greater gliders. So take home messages, well, that's so cute and that's going to make me a bit teary, little baby greater gliders. They, but they are declining and it's due to interactive um, impacts of habitat modification and climate change. Climate change is, is a real issue for these this species. By protecting and looking after habitat, we will help them get through the impacts of climate change. I feel quite confident about that because we know a lot and we're continuing to learn um, what we can do to build resi resilience for gliders. But we can only really do it with real active collaboration between all our um, levels of government, the universities, the science, the research sector, um, NRM groups, natural resource management groups, NGOs like Wildlife Queensland and, and, and you all out there listening. It's completely, it's so important. Um, and that every contribution is going to make a difference. Um, one nest box going up, protecting one habitat tree, it, it all adds up. Um, and yes, stay positive and join the Yellow Belly Glider Project. <laughs> and thank you for that. And thank you to all my colleagues that, um, and, and the years of work that's gone into Greater Gliders. It's not just stuff I've done. It's a, a whole body of research out there. Um, and thank you to all, everybody provide the beautiful photos um, and to you for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa, for um, so eloquently communicating the conservation message and story of the, of the poor little greater glider. It's, um, it is important to stay positive. There's a lot of negatives in there, but um, you know, it's, I keep thinking about the, the greater glider as a, as a leaf eating marsupial. It's so similar to the koala, but it's far less known. Um, certainly it's conservation needs are far less known within the community yet. They're probably, um, you know, even, even more at risk from climate change, from loss of habitat than, than the koala and the necessity to, you know, to feed on trees with a, with a, uh, a diameter at breast height of more than 30 centimetres plus needing at least three hollow bearing trees per hectare. It just makes their, um, their requirements so much more complicated. And their conservation so so much more intense and 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 the importance of that habitat quality so understated um, and then of course you know climate change the complexities of climate change are so incredible and we just are at the tip of the iceberg in understanding that and that little information you presented on graded gliders and how increased temperature impacts their metabolism um, just blows you away and it makes you concerned for, for what other secrets we don't know just yet um, Please guys, there's a couple of questions coming up on the Q&A section. Continue to put your questions in. You must have tons for Teresa after that talk. So thank you and, and keep them coming. 
I guess I'd like to introduce our second presenters now, Josh and Sam. They quite didn't, maybe didn't get the memo about um, it being about greater gliders today, but we'll let them talk about yellow belly gliders regardless because uh, they're fun, they go hand in hand, and they also need our conservation effort. Um, Sam and Josh are, 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 have started the Yellow Belly Glider Network and we're working with Wildlife Queensland and the Queensland Glider Network on the conservation of yellow belly gliders. And these two are photographers, and I'm pretty certain you will have all have seen at some stage the amazing images of both yellow bellies and greater gliders that have graced, um, you know, newspaper front pages, Wildlife Queensland images, or documents, um, and everything else in between. Um, Sam, Sam has a Bachelor in Zoology, which he completed at the University of Tasmania, um, and moved back to Brisbane and, and really developed a spectacular um, and deep passion for our nocturnal gliding marsupials. He channeled this in, in conjunction with uh, Josh Bowell into the Yellow Belly Glider project. And so Josh and Sam now are working hard at uh, highlighting the conservation requirements and the problems faced by both greater gliders and yellow belly gliders in southeast Queensland. And I'm really pleased to have them here today to talk to us about what they've been finding and how they've been finding these animals in the southeast Queensland region in the last 12 months or longer. Good morning, guys. Um, get stuck in, please. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you so much for that. We'll just share our screen. Hopefully this goes smoothly. Okay. Let me know. Can everyone see that? Has it popped up? All good to go. Excellent. Um, so my name's Sam. I'm Josh. Uh, and we have founded the Yellow Belly Glider Project. Um, so we'll dive straight into it. Um, so although we are known as the Yellow Belly Glider Project, we also have an ulterior focus on the Southern Greater Glider. Um, seeing as, as Teresa elegantly pointed out, they do share the same habitat. So it makes sense for us to um, record, survey and search for both of these amazing species. So just a little bit about our project. Um, so as Matt was stating, Josh and I are both photographers. Um, we've always had a natural affinity with photographing native animals. Um, and it all started by us just starting to wanting to photograph nocturnal marsupials being the, uh, the, the gliders of Southeast Queensland. The further we started diving into it, we, the more we realized that they were quite hard to find, um, which kind of started raising some concern. Upon looking into it a little bit further, uh, we started noticing that there wasn't a lot of attention being brought onto these amazing marsupials, um, which kind of drew, really drew our focus, particularly to the yellow belly glider, seeing as they're easily one of the hardest ones to find in southeast Queensland, but definitely the, uh, the greater glider as well. Um, upon diving a bit further, um, that kind of formed the foundation, foundation of a yellow belly glider project. So we've been going for around about 10, 11 months um, now. It's certainly been a, a very big uh, month, uh, sorry, 10 or 11 months. Uh, we've had an incredible support um, and we're starting to pull together quite a bit of uh, interesting information, which we'll show you today as well. So in terms of what we focus on, um, so we are a citizen science project. We really want to outline the fact that you don't need a science degree. You don't need a career in conservation to be able to help these amazing animals. Um, Josh is a metal fabricator. I work in an office now. Um, so you, you, all you need is that passion and that drive to actually be able to help out. Um, and um, it can really take you far in terms of um, helping our animals um, that are in desperate need. So in terms of what we look out for, um, we monitor uh, a variety of sites for both of these species being the uh, greater glider and yellow belly glider. We document their behaviours, breeding and their movements as well. We really want to uh, document their current distribution throughout. Uh, southeast Queensland and along with that we want to map where they're moving to so they're gliding pathways and bad travel corridors especially now development is really starting to increase. Uh, locating their feeding den and hollow trees so where are they living and where are they eating um, it's really applicable for both species um, and another really big landmark point is working with private landholders to conserve vital habitat. We wouldn't be able to do the amazing work that we do today um, without the incredible work of or the incredible help of these private landholders that have volunteered their properties for us to wander through the bush at night time um, to search for these amazing animals. Um, and along with that, we uh, support other organisations and councils with all our survey information. Um, this information is really important to make uh, strong environmental decisions. Um, so we hand that information off willingly um, to everybody who requires it to, to really help out these species. Um, we increase public awareness 
Um, there's still a lot of unknownness about these uh, gliding marsupials. Um, so the more we can get their, the images, their names, this data out there, the better it's going to be as well. And just a bit of a side focus, um, we really want to uh, make a documentary of uh, gliders within southeast Queensland, um, which is proving to be challenging, uh, seeing as gliders are usually really high up in a tree, um, and I'm terrified of heights, but we're getting there slowly. All right, so our main focus for the project is yellow belly gliders, but greater gliders are also in our sites. And what we found is during our searches for yellow bellies, we have come across greater gliders in areas where they've never been recorded. So um, it's been really good, um, the work we've been doing and getting access to private properties. Luckily, the greater glider is a lot easier to find than the yellow bellies um, due to their really bright white eye shine. So all we do is go out spotlighting um, and they don't really move around too much unlike the yellow belly gliders which are just insanely crazy. Um, so anyone can do it. Um, you just need a torch, um, a friend and just go out at night um, into the tall forests. Um, preferably with your torch, one that can switch to red light if you want to view the animal for a certain amount of time. So um, in our work in Logan, um, during our quest for yellow belly gliders, we've come across quite small little reserves that are actually due for development in the future. And um, we've found some populations of greater gliders where council were unaware. Um, and so Logan is a really special spot where the species can be found. Um, but also the development out that way um, is is big so we want to get in as much as we can but there's only two of us so we've just gotten volunteers coming on board now to really help us um you know spread spread our search out and um start you know getting the community aware just just to point out one, one small thing so if you do decide to go spotlighting yourself um and i really strongly encourage you to do so what you're looking for is this bright white eye shine, which you can see in the photo um, up on this page. You can see that that little white circle there. Um, if you go spotlighting and looking for yellow belly gliders, you'll just see these two eyes just staring back at you. Um, so they're quite noticeable to, to find. Um, and if you do locate some, um, if you let us know, we'll, uh, there's a bit of a page at the very end, but it's quite important for us to get this information so we can feed it onto the right areas. But um, yeah, 100% get out there. So one of the bigger points we want to outline um, is the use of red light torches. Um, this really minimizes disturbance. Um, so this is actually a video we're going to play you. Um, this was taken up uh, up in Tambourine Mountain, um, and it's a beautiful white crater glider. Um, usually if we spotlight them underneath white light, they'll sit in a tree like a gargoyle and just stare at you and not really do much. But underneath red light, um, they just go about their own business and it's kind of just wonderful. Which is ultimately happens. Uh, this one hit the ground and climbed up um, at here to find the way up the This is one of the uh, white wolves. Yeah, so we use white light spotlighting, and then when we find something, we'll look at it. Um, we try to do that as much as we can. Okay, so, and if you are really persistent, you might have, have one of an, an incredible night like Josh and I had um, a few months ago. So there's a, a site down in Park Ridge South, um, which is sadly enough up for development. Um, but we found 14 greater gliders uh, within this small patch of land. It was just this absolute hot spot um, of all these greater, and these are some of the photos. This is 12 of them. Two of them were hidden, so we couldn't really get photos, but this is the... 12 of the 14 individuals. But yeah, it, it was the most incredible hotspots um, that, uh, that, that we've never witnessed um, such a high density before. Um, so yeah, if, if you have one of those nights, it's something that will stay, stay with you for a very, very long time. And that site, um, we, we sort of try to get to every maybe six weeks just for a check um, and do a count. So what we have noticed in the last few counts, we've only been seeing about six to seven but um, a pair of powerful owls have moved into this small patch. Um, I should mention this patch is only about 600 square meters. Yeah. 
I think. Um, we've got a feeling the power flowers might have picked a few off because they're, they're quite condensed in this little spot, but that is just a theory. De definitely oversaturated. So moving on to yellow belly gliders, um, which is the, the, the name of the project. Um, this image that you're seeing on the, uh, in the photo is actually one of the first professional images of a green bank yellow belly glider, um, which was a, a really, really special knife. This was actually taken into an amazing property holder, Ernie's front yard, um, which is... Yeah, 10 metres from his front door. Yeah, which, which is amazing. Um, and they're, they're very, very rare within this region. So he's, he's incredibly lucky to have this um, a few steps from his front door. So yellow belly gliders are much, much harder to locate. Um, they have a, a home range of 60 hectares. So they are literally flying through the trees um, like, like Tarzan. Um, so they're quite hard to locate. They're um, easily one of the rarest. Um, we've only seen a handful of them um, within this particular region, which is why it's really kind of focused in on our project on this particular species. Um, they're actually not listed as vulnerable, uh, like the greater glider, which means that they don't really get that direct tension, uh, attention, but they are currently being assessed by the federal government to be re relisted as endangered, along with greater gliders and koalas. Um, so that's due to uh, come out at the end of this year, and that's mainly due to the fires. Um, so it's great that they're starting to get that bit more of, of attention. And Logan City Council is one of the lucky regions that has an established yellow belly glider population. So in terms of surveying these gliders, um, it's really hard. Spotlighting usually is, um, is very, very difficult because they don't have that beautiful white eye shine like greater gliders do. So usually what we have to do is we walk around the bush and we actually play their call um, to try and elicit a response back. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play um, their call. It is a bit of a loud recording. So if you're listening on headphones, I would strongly encourage just to turn it down just a little bit. But what you're about to hear is um, our callback um, from one of our speakers, and then you actually hear two yellow belly glider responding at the very end of it. So it's that harrowing call that we want to hear and that kind of remarks that they're going to be around. Um, and it gives me goosebumps every time I listen to it because you seldom hear it around these areas. Um, and it's probably one of the most unique calls um, you can hear within South East Queensland. And then um, if spotlighting isn't proving effective, one thing we also do is something called acoustic monitor, uh, monitoring. So we st uh, strap a little device to a tree um, and it essentially listens out for that call. Um, so it records from about 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, and it's, it's listening out for any nocturnal noises that you're hearing. So what you're seeing to, uh, to your right-hand side um, is something called a spectrograph. So that's your, the frequency of different calls or sounds. Um, and right in the middle of it is your yellow belly glider call. So you can see one call here, it's quite distinctive. And then you have a second call here. And just to put this in perspective, these little dots here, that's your boo book call. And at the very top, they're your micro bat calls. Um, so there's a lot going on at nighttime um, within the bush. So what we're looking for are these and it gives us an indication that they're in that area they might just be passing through that area and when they're actually frequenting it as well so we can really start tailoring when we're going to um, survey particular locations. I'll just mention the acoustic monitoring um, has probably been the most successful method we've used. Um, we've placed audio moths on random properties that gave us permission with um, no, no evidence of gliders on their property and we found some amazing things of gliders basically using their properties every night. Um, and we found new family groups just by acoustic monitoring. So it's um, it's ideally the main survey method we use for yellow belly gliders. Um, and we don't have to sit back and listen for weeks and hours of monitoring. We just run it through a core classifier we built, which will pick out what it thinks is a yellow belly glider core. Um, and it cuts down our our time to analyze recordings quite a bit, but it still takes a long time to go through. All right, another thing we look for is feed trees. The yellow bellies make a distinct um, incision in uh, smooth bark gum. So to us, this is um, like the holy grail, um, finding a feed tree, which we only know of a couple in Southeast Queensland. Um, this one I found in the backyard 
of a property in North McLean, which is in West Logan, um, just by driving past and I noticed it. Um, so when we find these, um, this property wasn't part of the project. Um, I just went and knocked on their door and now they, they keep me updated if I hear anything. Um, and we're gonna try to set some cameras up to this tree eventually um, and see if we can get, get them in action. Awesome. So in terms of what we're finding, um, so at the moment, just because the project's still in its infancy, we're doing a lot of presence and absence surveys. So just trying to get a general understanding about where yellow belly gliders and greater gliders actually are. Um, so we've been intensively serving reserves and private properties in uh, southwest Brisbane, so the, the Logan region, um, within the last 12 months. So we've discovered several previously undiscovered populations um, in three main pockets of bushlands. Um, and there's still so much area to be reserved. So just walking through the map. So this is your Daisy Hill Conservation Area. Um, so there's a, a nice population of greater gliders here. This section down here, this is the Park Ridge South area. Um, and it looks like that they're condensed within a, in, in a strong area. There's a bit of development happening through there. So it is a little bit concerning about all the movements that, that's going on in that location. But it's good to see that there are still some remnant um, large trees on private property where they're clinging on to. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an incredibly uh, amazing population. And there's still a lot of greenery that we need to get to to be able to survey. Um, so we're slowly moving through this location um, and just conducting surveys to get a really strong understanding about where they are um, and then feeding this information back to Logan City Council. Um, yeah, so the bulk of the West Logan region is mainly private property and that's why it's such a slow process to, to survey and get access. Most property owners don't really want, you know, people on their property so it's really great people do reach out to us and let us on because it's um really valuable moving on to yellow belly gliders um so this has definitely been our main focus just because there's just been no information recorded on them um so we've actually been chasing up really old records of yellow belly gliders back from the 1980s just to get a really good indication of where they might be um, we've found two individualized populations which you're looking at here um, so one in the Green Bank area, which we think there might be a stronghold population within the Green Bank Army base, just because it hasn't been developed in such a long time. Um, and they're all kind of coming out and moving on from that location. Um, and we're finding that dotted all through Green Bank. And then the second population is in the South McLean area where those feed trees are. Um, but again, there's still so much greenery within that location um, that we're, we're slowly moving through it. And we're hopeful that we're gonna find more populations as we are. We keep on surveying um, and, and keep getting out there as well. And what we've uh, started doing with our acoustic monitoring is the big large sections to the left of the map, which is Spring Mountain, Flinders Peak. We've begun acoustic monitoring there too. And um, you know, you think looking to the right, you'll get them in that large section, but it just isn't um, necessarily the case. So hopefully our acoustic monitors pick up um, new populations in there, but um, it might not be the case. And another thing that we're starting to locate, now this is requires a lot more research, it's just something that we're starting to, um, to, to notice, is just some morphological differences in, in uh, yellow belly gliders that we're starting to move through. So here you have three different images of yellow belly gliders, one from Tambourine Mountain, one from Green Bank, and then another one from Mount Barney, um, just from the New South Wales borders. Just noticing size differences, um, also coloration differences. You can see that the Tambourine and Mount Barney yellow belly glider has your um, your dorsal stripe down the back of it, um, whereas the green bank doesn't. Potentially that could be an age thing, but it just requires uh, more focus. Um, but it's just something that we're starting to pick up on. We're also noticing differences in calling behaviors such as length, frequency, and intensity. Um, the yellow belly gliders on the New South Wales and Queensland border um, are really vocal. That recording I played before is from that location. So they, they just constantly squeak all night. Whereas in the Tambury Mountain, you might hear it once and then you won't hear it again. Um, and the same goes for Green Bank as well. They pretty much call once they're leaving the hollow and when they're coming back to it, but that's essentially it. Um, so it kind of just raises more questions of where we want to focus into um, in the long term. Um, but at the moment, it's just trying to find really good populations that we, um, that we want to start focusing on. on. Excellent. So 
Moving down in terms of uh, whether everybody listening is interested in this, um, as Teresa pointed out, the work that we do um, is extremely beneficial to their conservation. Councils and government can only do so much. Um, so even just going through a local reserve and doing a spotlight, um, it can really benefit the populations. Um, so we're going to be holding another volunteer workshop in the coming months. Um, and there's a variety of things that you can help out our project with. Um, Remarking that we, we look at grey gliders as much as we look at yellow belly gliders. Um, but again, it's letterbox drops so we can start getting access to more private properties. Daylight surveys, so looking for those feed marks. Um, deploying and retrieving acoustic monitors and analysing uh, recordings. Deploying and retrieving cameras, uh, nocturnal surveys, uh, call playback and spotlighting as well. Um, social media content and then the, the potential of nest box monitoring, which again is what Teresa pointed out, that it's uh, proving to be very important for grey glider populations. So if this interests you, uh, please note down our email address um, and we can certainly let you know when our next volunteer workshop will be. Yeah, we just held a workshop. Um, it went quite well. Um, a few people that stayed around um, got to see a couple of yellow belly gliders in action. Um, so it can be really fun to getting out, um, making new friends and, and seeing what wildlife, you know, we have out there. So that's basically it from us. Um, now, we just have one piece of footage to show you. Now, this gives me goosebumps every time I, I look at this. So a bit of story behind this footage. Um, this is a greater glider that we've nicknamed Gizmo. Um, she lives in Burbank in Brisbane. Um, and we always thought Gizmo was a he up until uh, uh, last breeding season. Um, I went to have a quick look at Gizmo just to check on. Just every six weeks, I like to pop my head in there. Um, and then I just noticed Gizmo all of a sudden had a second tail. Um, and then you looked a little bit closely and there was a little baby hanging on her back. Um, so it's the most spectacular footage um, that Josh managed to capture. So um, I'll play for you now. So it's uh, Mother Gizmo just giving her young little Joey uh, a, a bath. Um, and you can see how they use that pouch. Um, it, it's just incredible to witness. And if you're going out spotlighting, you know, August, September, you might be lucky you know, to see a baby greater glider in the wild yourself. So, you know, I really encourage people to get out there and um, and start looking. It's um, extremely important and beneficial to uh, to greater gliders and their population. Um, so if you need any tips, tips, hints or help, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we love questions. Um, so yeah, uh, we're, we're always here to, um, to assist anybody with that, that passion to move forward with it. Excellent, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Josh and Sam for um for letting us know how you've gone about what you've been doing and it's so uplifting I'm sure for everyone listening to know that some um, like you said you don't need to come from a science background you just need to have a casual interest in wildlife um, and you can get out get amongst it and see some amazing native species um, if you are going out spotlighting do be conscious of your impact that you will have on native species if you're lighting them up with a white light for a while uh, we operate under some pretty strict ethics conditions um, and we encourage everybody just to be very, very conscious of the amount of light they shine on a greater glider or a yellow belly glider. Red light is in fact the key and, and um, as the guy said, you get to see animals doing their natural behaviours with the red light and that's exactly what you'd like uh, to see when you're spotlighting. Um, it's pretty interesting that you've been able to highlight just the, uh, the amount of amazing species found in, in the Logan area um, and that's really, really encouraging. Um, but it's also important, I guess, we spoke about, and as Teresa spoke about, is the, the habitat quality that is so in, incredible, incredibly important. So we have a lot of green space in that area as protected green space, Spring Mountain uh, Reserve, Flinders Goodman Conservation Estate, and even the Flinders Karawatha Corridor as a whole. Um, and, you know, looking at a map, that's a big tract of green land. And you'd like to look at those greater glider and yellow belly glider sightings and think that there's plenty of habitat there but it all comes down to that habitat quality there may be the trees there but there may not be the hollows there may be um also you know regrowth that aren't quite big enough to sustain the population so it's not quite as simple as just seeing green space and thinking that it's all suitable for native wildlife and um, i just have to say too blokes here um you sadly a yellow belly glider call didn't come across to anybody so we didn't get to hear it but um you can check out the yellow belly glider instagram page and you will hear that call and see it over and over again. So I jump, I absolutely recommend that you all jump on the and follow the Yellow Belly Glider Instagram page. The blokes put up some pretty interesting stuff um, and it's well worth having a look at. Um, all right, I might bring us over to the question and answer section now. Um, there are a bunch of really good questions and I'll, so I'll go through a few 
and hand them over to both Teresa and Jess, Josh and Sam to, um, to try and answer. Um, there's probably too many of them for us to answer in the, in the one event, but like I said, we will do our best to answer them on paper and have those answers associated with the webinar replay from the Wildlife Queensland uh, webpage. Um, this is a good one from Christine Donkin. Um, she's asked, and I guess maybe Teresa can let us know this, do greater gliders den individually or do they den in a group? Uh, yes, good question. And I did mean to touch on that, sorry. Um, so no, they are usually solitary. However, during the breeding season, which is about now, they'll hook up with a buddy, a mate, um, and they will co-den then. And then of course, when the juvenile, um, when the baby comes along, the, um, the juvenile will cohabit a den with um, its mother until she boots it out when it's about nine months um, years of age. So very different to our Patura, so the yellow belly gliders and sugar gliders and squirrel gliders, which um, yeah do cohabit in family groups. So uh, they'll all there'll be three, you know, yellow belly gliders, three in a den. <coughs> sugar gliders, there can be a whole gaggle of them. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Small gliders love to bunch up, but I've never come across in a, in a hollow in a nest box, at least anyhow, um, more than one greater glider and it's dependent young. So um, a difference between the, the groups there. There's been a couple of questions about the nest boxes and I can probably answer those in, in regards to, you know, dimensions and sizes and things. We've typically always put up um, rear entry graded glider boxes supplied, built and designed by Hollow Log Homes. They're a fantastic box and they um, are so sturdy and strong and we've had great success with those boxes. We haven't deviated away from that. Whether there are other designs or shapes that work, uh, it's quite likely. Uh, we just haven't broken away from what works for us at the moment. But uh, we're happy to take um, you know, advice or, or findings from other projects and maybe implement that and work with Hololog Homes to look at other box shapes that may or may not work. It's all about getting the greater gliders to use those nest boxes into the future uh, while we let trees hollow out. Um, some other questions here. Uh, let me go down to Marie Hawker. She asks for Sam and Josh, what device do you use to record the yellow belly glider call? Maybe you can let us know about um, what you use. Yeah, we use um, audio moths, which are a small sort of cheap alternative to say a song meter. Simply because we're working mainly in semi-rural areas, it's like a tangled web of private properties that um, form like a wildlife corridor, so we can place more out. So yeah, audio moths is what we use. They're, they're quite cheap as well, so they're about $100 a monitor, um, and then you get a case for about $20, um, and then you strap that to a tree for three, three weeks. Um, so it's quite quite easy to, to get yourself up off of the ground if, if acoustic monitoring at night time interests you as well. Yeah, that's good. It's a bit of revelation um, and such a good way to passively survey for a species, just sticking a monitor out and walking away. Um, another question for you two, what type of camera and setup do you use to photograph your gliders, especially given uh, we don't want to flood them with light and blind them to be fair pickings for a powerful hour? Yeah, so we, we use big telephoto lens. Um, so I, Josh and I both use 500 mil lens, so they're, they're absolutely massive. Um, we only photograph under red lights, um, and then our flash is positioned far off to the side, so you're getting light from the side of it um, to avoid direct white light into to its irises. Um, so you're avoiding that direct white flash, um, and then any light while we're constantly trying to focus is all in any spread light. So we try and minimize disturbance as much as we can while photographing. Um, it's something we're very, very conscious about, and we'll only take one or two photos before we move on. And you'll find most of our photos are cropped anyway, so it's gonna look like we're a lot closer than we actually are. So we're actually standing back quite a distance. Yeah, that's good information. Thanks for that, guys. Hey, Teresa, someone has asked, um, or Sally Thompson, I apologize, has asked, do greater glider or yellow belly glider move through urban areas like possums or are they restricted to forested areas alone? Um, they pretty much restricted to for the forested tracks. Like there has been, I don't know if anybody's seen those rope bridges that goes across um, big highways down in northeast New South Wales. My supervisor did a lot of work on those and, and has shown that um, some species of gliders will use those rope bridges between two intact 
patches of habitat, but they're mostly like the squirrel gliders, um, you know, the, the, the smaller types. Um, I think what Josh and Sam probably be able to comment on this too, but in the fragmented urban areas of around <clears throat> Brisbane, because um, greater gliders, they're not very good at dispersing. Um, I, I think they're able to get through some to some different patches of habitat only if obviously if there's a corridor there that they, they can move from tree to tree. Yellow belly gliders are a bit more mobile, but again, if there's no trees, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, that's right. The, um, out West Logan Way, we know the yellow belly gliders are moving through properties, but um, they're, you know, acreage blocks with, with trees every maybe five to 10 metres, yep. I guess, um, they can glide through, but then they, you get to properties in between that are fully cleared. So um, they can still move through at this point with the greater gliders, we're still trying to, um, you know, get on properties to see if they're around. Yeah, so most certainly not like a, a brush tail or a ring tail that'll be happily in your urban environment, but only areas that have got some vegetation and some connectivity. Yeah. Um, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Tiffany Harrington has asked a pretty uh, detailed question here, and I'll probably put this to you, Teresa. I'll read the full question out because it has some, some background. She says, as you know, greater glider habitat is protected primarily by Commonwealth EVBC and in Queensland under the Vegetation Management Act. Um, for a development to be assessed by the Commonwealth under the EPBC, the development needs to have or is likely to have a significant impact. With the Vegetation Management Act, there is a five hectare urban area, urban purpose exemption with that in mind. Do you think that what would be the extent of an impact that would consider significant to impact greater glider habitat? So I guess, you know, what would trigger um, a significant impact to greater glider habitat? Would it be five hectares or larger or smaller? Oh, good one, Tiffany. Um, uh, I think at the moment, and particularly in some of the small little patches that we've found greater gliders um, around in urban Brisbane, like Chambers Flat that Matt um, and I had a look in some time ago, I think anything that you're going to take out of it is going to have, have to have an impact, maybe not immediately, but it's uh, down the track. It's, it's just got to. It, um, yeah, it, uh, yes, I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it there. But I, I just think that at this stage where there is just so, so much interaction with so many pressures on, on the species, um, just a, any more loss of habitat is, just can't really be um, helping it at all. It, it will have to have an impact. I guess that's the issue with, with legislation is it's black and white, but in this situation, it really depends on the, the extent and population size and extent of habitat that they're occupying. Um, you know, for a, somewhere out in the Carnarvons where there's lots of habitat, losing one or two hectares may not have a material impact on that population in the long term, whereas we're talking about populations in an urban environment that are already fragmented and trying to hang on in small areas, then in fact any single loss of a habitat tree or half a hectare would have a significant impact. Um, there's been quite a few questions based around the impacts of development in these areas um, and the mitigation of those and it's just not necessarily something we know the answer to. Uh, it's, it's something that probably has to be put towards um, planning departments, state and federal government and local councils because, you know, there's, it's a very grey area. But suffice to say that in those urban environments, we strongly believe that any loss of habitat is, you know, would be really critical to some of those populations. Sorry, I apologise, I let my finger off the mute button. Teresa, this is from Sharon Co. Um, can you elaborate on the impacts of prescribed burning on graded gliders and how these can be mitigated? And this will be our last question. I apologise, everybody. Uh, sorry, Matt, was that to me? Yeah, to you, Teresa. Yeah. Um, yes, so prescribed burning. It's a tricky one because we do need to have prescribed burning, particularly after seeing those um, scary wildfires go through. Um, and I think there's a lot of work going um, into this around the science at the moment to look at what the what a good level of uh, prescribed burning can be. So it, I think we have to have some prescribed burning. 
happening. Um, but I, what the Brisbane City Council have done, which, <laughs> which I showed that slide of, uh, raking away the litter, I would love to, to get some science around if that is actually working. I can only assume that it is um, because I sort of recommended it in a very early paper of mine years and years and years ago. Um, but to be honest, I'm not really sure if it, it perfectly works, but it logically would have to. Um, but that is obviously a lot of work. Um, the, yeah, the real problem is those prescribed burns are taking out in, que in Queensland, I'm not quite sure else outside of Queensland, but I do know in Queensland, we are very much reliant on those dead hollow bearing trees, those stags to make up the shortfall in our um, live habitat tree um, resource. So um, having to, we really do need to look after those in some way and um, prescribe burns is, is taking them out. Um, all I can sort of think of is how we can uh, come up with some prescribed burning measures that is not regular every three years and um, in a mosaic. And that has been talked about in the literature quite, quite a bit. Yeah, again, it's such a great area and the, the question of burns and management of burns, conservation and prescribing um, prescribed burns that, that don't do um, long-term damage, you know, trying to achieve the aims is just so complicated and absolutely not straightforward. All right, everybody, thanks so much for listening there today. Um, and thank you for all those people that have sent in questions. There are quite a few and we will get to writing some answers for you and making those available, like I said, via the uh, webinar replay on the events page of the Wildlife Queensland page under our um, Talking Wildlife series. Uh, a few things I have to firstly straight up thank again Logan City Council for funding this webinar and being proactive and um, being thoughtful of greater gliders and helping get this information out there. Um, we also have to absolutely thank the, the team at Logan City Council, the Health Environment and Waste Branch. We work with them uh, all the time and they're such fantastic people and we can't thank them enough for what they do for wildlife in the Logan region. Uh, we do have an event on the 19th of June, so next Saturday, that will be at the Green Bank Community Centre. It's another uh, Greater Glider workshop. We love, it's a free event. We'd love as many people to come along. I'll be giving a presentation on greater gliders and we'll also have hollow log homes attending to talk about nest boxes, nest box design and, and the success they've had with greater gliders. So you can look at, find that event and book your spot um, on Eventbrite or by the Wildlife Queensland webpage. On the webpage, jump into the Queensland Glider Network page and you'll find all the links to the Eventbrite booking site. Um, well, thanks again for joining in. We really appreciate your time. Get out there, have a great look and a great search for greater gliders out in your local bushland. You might spot all kinds of great nocturnal wildlife. Uh, be conscious of hollow bearing trees in your backyard or your area and just appreciate the natural environment. Thanks very much for joining in. Take care.